You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another History of the Great War interview. This will be a first in a series of interviews where I chatted with the authors of a series of books being released by the Great War Group. The series is called Great War Group Introductions, and they are structured as books that are approachable to readers of any knowledge level about the Great War. Today, I was joined by Nikolai Eberholst, who has written a book titled simply, Austria-Hungary. The book is an overview of the experiences of Austria-Hungary during the war, the challenges that it faced, and an evaluation of its performance during the conflict. Austria-Hungary's role in the start of the war is probably the most covered part of its entire experience in the conflict. The entire course of events in July 1914 is, of course, a topic far too large for an introduction to an interview. But by the end of the second week of August, Austria-Hungary would be at war with Serbia, Russia, Britain, France, and Montenegro. In the years that followed, Italy and Romania and the United States, along with several other nations, would follow. As a general overview of the course of the war, when the war began, Austria-Hungary would attack Serbia, while also defending itself from the Russian attacks in Galicia. In both cases, these efforts would be classified as a failure. And in Serbia, the attacks would fail to remove the small Balkan nation from the war, while in the east, the Russian advance would overrun much of Galicia. These failures against Russia would be the setup for the disastrous Carpathian campaigns during the winter of 1914-1915. The fighting that would occur over the winter, with the Austrians attempting to push the Russians back to relieve the beleaguered fortress of Shimashal, would be done in some of the worst conditions of the entire war. To say that men literally froze to death during the attacks is not an exaggeration. The result of the first six months of the war was disastrous for the Austro-Hungarian army. The total number of casualties among Austro-Hungarian armies engaged in the theater of, of the Carpathians was around 50%, a staggering percentage, even by First World War standards. After the disasters against the Russians, in early 1915, Italy would join the war against Austria-Hungary, adding another problem that had to be handled. The fighting along the two nations' shared border along the Asanzo is infamous for its futility and suffering. The fighting is often portrayed from the Italian perspective, often, you know, really questioning (laughs) why they would attack in the same area 11 times. While I don't disagree with that mindset, it is at least does say something positive for the Austro-Hungarian troops that were defending against the Italian attacks. On the Italian front, the Empire's troops would prove to be an incredibly resilient force, and able to match Italian aggression with constant counterattacks and a brutally violent defense. On the Russian front, there would be both successes and failures. The gorlis tarnov offensive of May 1915, launched in conjunction with the German army, would be an incredible success. Then in 1916, the Brusilov Offensive would result in a major defeat, although it would once again be a defeat that the Austro-Hungarian army would eventually recover from to prevent further Russian advances. 1917 would be the years of the great victories for Austria-Hungary, with the Russian summer offensives being stopped very quickly and then the great victory of Caporetto. Caporetto would be the first major change in the Italian front since the beginning of the war, but Italy would still remain in the war. 1918 would then be a very tough year for Austria-Hungary, with economic problems around food and industrial production nearly grinding everything to a halt. So many essentials for both life and fighting became almost unheard of in Austria-Hungary by the end of the war, and by the time of the final offensive of the war, which were targeted at Austria-Hungary, soldiers at the front were being issued paper underwear and were on ration levels that were simply non-sustaining. Over the course of the interview, we talk at some length about the evaluation and perception of Austria-Hungary's performance and contribution to the war. It's a topic that's often tainted by the shadow of the empire's early failures and a general focus on histories on telling the story of the war from the perspective of Austro-Hungarian enemies. After the interview, 
If you would like to find out more about Austria-Hungary during the war, check out the link in the episode description or head on over to greatwargroup.com where you can find a list of all of the Great War Group introductions, which I'm told are going to be shipping on October 11th, which is today. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Hello everyone and welcome to another History of the Great War interview. This time I am joined by Nikolai Eberholst, the author of Austria-Hungary, which is coming from the Great War Group Introductions book series that's coming out soonish, if you're listening to this episode on release, Uh, and also the creator of the Pike Gray 1418 Twitter account, which has been going on since July 2017 and is a fantastic source for random pictures of the Austro-Hungarian army during the war and other Eastern European matters. Um, So I just want to start off this interview, we know, with what has drawn you to the history of Austria-Hungary during the First World War? Yeah, I I, I actually started um, uh, being interested more in World War II. Uh, and then, then I, I, I slowly got more in, into into World War One, and I just found that um, I've always I've, I've always been drawn to the odd things uh, in whatever topic that I that I uh, dive onto. Uh, so, so I've never really it wasn't the Western Front that that caught my interest. It was all it was first the Italian Front, and then of course from 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 there. Uh, going on the fact that I spoke German <laughs> or spoke, well, at least understood and read German uh, and not Italian sort of picked it for me in that way. But I've always been, been going for, for the, the odd things, uh, not not the one that, that everybody else is trying to do and trying to find a, a place where I can see that there is something that I feel needs to be like a story that needs to be told that isn't being told um, as much, of course, there are other people talking about it. It's not not a unique idea to talk about Austria Hungary, but but uh, but of course, it's much more um, uh, focused. That is the history of the First World War on the Western Front, on 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 Britain uh, and this, and then of course, you, I can go and 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 focus on 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 Germany as the other part, but then. Why not take one step further and go for the other one <laughs> uh, on that alliance? So yeah, that's how I, I got into it, and then I just um, just found my my niche point. 
Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I've really enjoyed sort of uh, following your Twitter account over the years and seeing the the pictures that, you know, you surface uh, on that account that that show what what it was like uh, over on the other side of, of the war. Yeah, I think I think um, purely for because that that's just a, a way to <laughs> to to promote myself and build a following and and do things of course uh, on Twitter it's not the only thing but I, I I do think that that we can learn a lot by by seeing and like a visual representation of of this whole other thing that for most people seem like something completely foreign that they haven't seen before because you can see the differences in in I get so many comments on how uh, for example, trenches look different in on the eastern front than on the western front. You see how uh, many comments about, oh, are they still wearing cloth hats in 1916? Yes, of course they are, because it's it's a whole different kind of war and a, and a whole different kind of of uh, economical power behind the army. Um, so so there are a lot of different aspects that we're, by showing a photo you can get into a conversation with people uh, and 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 talk about like what what is the differences and, and and bring it up that way so so while it is not the the only thing that i i do show pictures uh, i think it really works in a good way to start the conversation so so speaking of sort of austria hungary in the war so what were their plans in the event of a war so everybody kind of knew that a war was probably going to happen at some point. Everybody was kind of thinking about it. So how had they prepared for a conflict and what were they planning to do should it occur? Yeah, if we start with the the, the preparation, because I think that 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 is what determines a lot of the, the Austro-Hungarian war planning at, at the time. Austria-Hungary is, of course, this, um, this split uh, nation. It's a dual monarchy it's with two halves, one, one control. Well, one is Hungary and one is Austria, as the name implies. Uh, and there is a lot of tension between these two. And the Hungarians, uh, for a long time before, are very strict on the budget for the military because they feel that the military is being controlled mainly by the Austrian, the, the Austro-Germans, or the Germans, if you call it a, as a nationality. But, but um, they, they're feeling that they are the ones who are controlling it. And they are very reluctant to give a lot of... of uh, of money to the army, feeling that the army could be used to to you know uh, quell uh, Hungarian independence and uh, and and their um, their sort of sovereignty within within the uh, the dual monarchy. So there isn't a lot of money to go by, which means that the army is the peacetime army uh, is is quite small. It's only about four hundred and fifty thousand um, people for for an enormous empire with a lot of 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 uh, of inhabitants uh, there there are 50 million people around 50 million people in uh, in 1914 in austria hungary it's the third most populous country in europe at the time only after germany and russia um so but but it's a very very small army um it also means that the percentage of of people going into the armed services uh, like the number of, of men per per thousand or something it is much lower in in Austria Hungary than it is in, in in a lot of the other countries, which means that Austria doesn't have a uh, a lot of people to to draw on once uh, mobilization is is declared. Um, one one other thing they will run out of is of course uh, reserves when um, when uh, when casualties casualties comes in <laughs> and you have to replace the ones who are going off in the in in the first place. You don't have the men already trained and already prepared for it. Uh, at least you don't have enough. And Austria, Hungary is going to need a lot very, very quickly. But because they have this small army, uh, as, as I said, 450,000 uh, in a peacetime army and upon mobilization, it goes up to about like 1. 1, 1. 1.8 million, uh, which is still a relatively small army. It's about uh, divided into... Um, uh, roughly 60 divisions, uh, some like 40, 48 or something infantry and 11 cavalry or something like that. Um, but for example, France will have 88 divisions upon mobilization. Um, and they're, they're a country with 
with fewer inhabitants. So, so it is a small army. And of course, Austria-Hungary is also a country that, due to political tensions, we shouldn't get too much into now. But it is a country that is already realizing in the in the years before the war that they're being surrounded by hostile powers. Uh, I mean, pretty much everybody is a potential enemy for Austria-Hungary, except for Germany, which is their ally, and uh, neutral Switzerland, which is probably not going to be uh, an issue. Uh, even even countries like Italy, who is a, a let, let's call them a public um, ally, they don't really trust them to begin with. And then uh, Romania, which is sort of a secret ally, they have a they have a, a secret treaty with with the king uh, that that he's going to support, and it, which also doesn't come to anything, of course, when war is declared. But even those two countries are some. Yeah, there might be actually come a war after all, even though we are allies. Um, so they're facing a, a, either a very local war with just one power, which could most realistically it would be something like Serbia or Italy or Russia. Those are the, the, the main ones they're working with uh, in, the, in their war planning. But it's very likely that it would become a multi-front war very quickly. And um, because they have a very small army, they, they have about six field armies is what, what, what they will be divided into in the event of war. They really quickly realize that if a multiple uh, front war comes, uh, they won't have the, the necessary armies to be fully prepared on every single front, um, which means that 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 um, that the planners, the the uh, the general staff, doesn't have enough men at the start to do exactly what they want, which is of course to go on the offensive anywhere. So what they're planning is they're writing up different scenarios, uh, different war plans. So they will have a War plan S, uh, or sorry, a war, war plan B for the Balkans, uh, which of course, why I say S is because it's mainly uh, to, towards Serbia. Uh, then a, a, a war plan R, which is against Russia, they will also have one one I against Italy, um, and then they will also have uh, something like a R plus S. So if it's both of them together working together, which is the most uh, likely scenario that that that's the sorry I said S again the <laughs> B plus R uh, would be Serbia plus uh, Russia against Austria Hungary and then they're trying to build as much flexibility into their war plans as possible um, uh, during peacetime so that they will be able to react when things get rolling if one country uh, joins the war against them. Uh, they can do one thing. If it then changes, they should be able to do something else. Um, so what they do is they divide their army into three parts. Um, they have what is called the Minimal Group of Balkan, which is uh, consists of, of, of two armies which will deploy on the um, the, uh, the Serbian front in, in, in Bosnia and Dalmatia um, against uh, Montenegro and Serbia, effectively. Uh, then they have the A group, which will is the largest, uh, more than half the army, um, consisting of three armies in total, will deploy on the uh, the what will be the eastern front in in Austria Hungary. We actually talk they actually talk about it as the northern front, uh, which can be a bit confusing, but but for most people, let's talk about it as as the eastern front against Russia. They will deploy in in Galicia and um, and be ready to move there. And then they have the the flexibility uh, part, which is the the B group, consists of the second army, uh, which can either move to Serbia if you want to go on the offensive there, or they can go to Galicia uh, against Russia if you need them there. So that's how they how they're planning to do it and trying to build in the flexibility, so that depending on what what happens, they will have men enough. In either place, of course, this goes horribly wrong when 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 war is declared, um, because they sort of Russia isn't in it to begin with, and and the uh, the Austro-Hungarian uh, chief of the general staff, uh, Conrad von Hutzendorf, he um, decides that he will try to to strike a very quick blow against Serbia first. So what he does is, upon uh, declaration of war, 
Serbia. Uh, he uh, he decides to mobilize the Minimal Group of Balkan, which is the two armies uh, against uh, Serbia and Montenegro, and then sent the B Group to Serbia. Then, uh, of course, things move on, and over the next couple of days, it becomes pretty clear that that Russia will join in in this war against uh, Germany and and Austria Hungary and intervene in this. Uh, so so they decide to change it up and say, okay, we have to send uh, th- this uh, uh, um, B group, the flexibility group, back to Galicia because that's where we have to do it now. But at that point, you've already started the mobilization of the A group, which means that they have to finish first because you don't have the rolling stuff. You don't have enough of, of all of this to, to, to go about it. And, and they will have to fully deploy before you can start moving this force that has been sent to the wrong place, essentially, because now it's much more serious what's happening in the East than what's happening in the Balkans all of a sudden. Um, what essentially happens is that this, this one army, they're desperately needing an army uh, extra everywhere because they, they don't have enough. And they basically waste the whole of, of August and September moving one of their six armies all over the place. And it doesn't really participate in anything. It's, it's in the Balkan too short to actually do anything and make a difference there. And it only arrives in Galicia to take part in the defeat. So... Mm-hmm. Even it, uh, even with even with the fewer armies and the too few people, they even waste uh, <laughs> s- some of that uh, just messing up the mobilization and the planning. Yeah, I, th- I feel like you know, reading about sort of Austria-Hungary's position before the war and when the war starts, they they don't have enough resources to do everything that they want to do, but then they make the worst possible decision, which is not just committing to something. Like with your reserves, you need to. Pick a spot and go, not sort of flip flop right in the middle, uh, causing the worst possible scenario. Yeah, it it, it really is that exact uh, the problem that they they do end up really making the worst choices that you that they can in the situation that they're in, and their their attempt, which is not an unreasonable uh, and not not a dumb attempt given their situation, to build in flexibility sort of becomes a big issue because it doesn't work out. Of course, you can always go back and say, oh, they should have known that Russia would come in and they should have just done that. But yeah, it's easy to do in hindsight. And and I think we can all, all agree that, that it is not the right decision that is made. And they should have thought about it and they shouldn't have focused on on Serbia as much as they did. But then again, Serbia is the main enemy. That is why they started the war. And there is a belief that they might actually be able to launch this quick offensive before Russia is ready. But Russia is much faster in mobilization, uh, in mobilizing their own forces than anybody expects, which means that suddenly you have to move uh, all your forces east. Then again, you also have a really bad cooperation or coordination between uh, Germany and Austria, meaning that there isn't really a good agreement of what is going to happen here. And this, um, I mean, the the Austrians are not completely involved in this whole German Schlieffen plan idea of sending everything west first and leaving the east uh, relatively undefended except for for a single army in, in East Prussia. They are not thinking all the time that, oh, we have to carry the whole load in the East to begin with. Um, the, and, and again, you can criticize it and you can look and did they not know and was it just, did it just play into to, to, uh, to, uh, Chief of General Staff Conrad's um, uh, way of, 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 of telling the story later to say that there wasn't this, but but there is an he has an idea that there will be a coordinated attack from uh, both sides in the east of course this is unrealistic given that the germans only have one army uh but the the plans are not really written for that, for that so so there are things that you don't know and and things where you can say okay that's stupid yeah but you don't know until it, it gets going completely yeah no, absolutely I could not could not agree more so, so you kind of touch on it there a little bit, but the, 
I would say the overall perception of the Austro-Hungarian efforts during the war are not favorable, uh, bordering on complete failure. Um, do you think that this is a fair assessment of their contribution to the uh, sort of central powers of war effort? Both yes and no. I mean, you you you, you can always look at all the bad ones, um, but a lot of it comes from a, a few things that go go wrong in the beginning. I mean, that there, there are always issues in the Austro-Hungarian army with the leadership. The uh, the, the leadership has issues. There there are really bad generals in the Austro-Hungarian armies. There are also some very very good ones some very good ones, but there are a lot of bad ones, and a lot of them are also in, in quite high positions, which create a lot of problems, of course, as it would. Um, but as the German allies also always seem to admit, is that, the, that there's nothing wrong with the Austro-Hungarian soldier as a soldier. Uh, and when, when you look at how how the Austro-Hungarian soldier fights during, when he is uh, competently led either by his own or by, say, German forces, which have, uh, or, sorry, German generals, or in close cooperation with German uh, forces, where, um, um, which happens a lot in 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 the East, going from 1915 on, they're performing well or as well as 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 their allies. Um, uh, and they 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 are uh, winning battles. Uh, it's when it's often when they're on their own and when their uh, their their uh, chief uh, Conrad decides to go on these these already doomed unrealistic uh, <laughs> adventures. <laughs> One could be tempted to say, um, but but these offensives that that everybody is saying, oh. That, that shouldn't happen. Or the Germans are saying that this this is not. You can't win this. You you can't do it. But he wants to do it because he wants to win back some some prestige lost in in, in earlier battles, and he wants to win his own battles. And he doesn't want uh, Austria Hungary to play second fiddle to Germany all the time and just be uh, a, a, a subordinate to German Germany, which is also a legitimate position to take, given that it is a, an empire. It is not. It is not. Uh, it, it is not an alliance where it is uh, where it is already decided that Germany will be the main uh, one, and the others just have to follow. So, so you you, you can again criticize him for saying, "Oh, you should just go as, as the Germans want." But then again, that is also a, a lot to ask for 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 a country or an empire like Austria-Hungary to just submit fully uh, to the to their allies. Um, but yeah, if if you want to talk about like like what what goes wrong is and 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 how that affects the way it is, the whole as we talked about the, the whole bundling of the of the mobilization messes up things for Austria Hungary in both Serbia and in Galicia, and they lose a lot of people. Um, use about uh, lose in 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 total about a quarter of a million men within the first month and a half of the war. Which is an incredible amount of casualties to take for for a country that doesn't really have, as we said before, a prepared reserve. Um, they don't have the men to fill it up. They they have to to quickly uh, train new officers. The, the the casualties in Galicia amongst the officer corps is like seventy five percent. It is all the peacetime officers, all the peacetime trained soldiers. Uh, the well-trained ones, the ones who are, who've done the education, as as well as as we haven't really talked about, is a multi multinational army, and everybody speaks uh, different languages. And before the the war, there is a there is a requirement for officers to learn the languages of the men that they're commanding. That works well in peacetime, of course, but it doesn't work well when you have to 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 train new officers within the, a, a, a few weeks or, or or a few months they don't have the time to learn uh four or five different languages because they they're being sent to to a very um a very polyglot regiment um so, so of course you, you you don't have that so so because of these incredible casualties they have in the beginning because of some of the unpreparedness they do not rise again from the early blows and and when you then get into something 
like the bigger campaigns that, that they participated in in 1915, like the Carpathians, where they, lo- they lose 800,000, they suffer 800,000 casualties in, in, in the, a, a number of months. This is something that leaves the army completely depleted of everything from you know, uniforms to ammunition to, f- to food to trained personnel. Uh, you have to to reduce the requirements for for or, or the um, the standards of of uh, of recruitment. You have to re- reduce the time that you train people. You have to reduce the amount of uh, like rifle rounds that they can fire before they go to the front. All of this will add on to them having to really uh, well not have to, but but that they will struggle a lot throughout the war with with already trying to to make up this whole uh mess that they they're in from the beginning but i mean if 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 we look at some of the the classic blunders it is the serbian campaigns in 1914 it's galicia we have the whole carpathians uh, we have uh the brusilla offensive these are some of the major ones that that people think of where, where, where there's a lot of casualties where it really goes wrong where the Germans will have to come in and, and save them but then there are also all the other ones in between and some of them are a lot in between where it actually goes quite well um, the uh, the Gaulitsa Tunnel offensive in the east is often portrayed as a German victory but a lot of the soldiers uh, are, are Austro- Austro-Hungarian soldiers there, there are Austro-Hungarian armies participating in it under German leadership, but there's a lot of of Austro Hungarian soldiers fighting these battles. Um, you have the um, the uh, Romanian campaign. Austro Hungarian soldiers perform well. First Army uh, under uh, Arts von Stauzenburg, who later becomes the Chief of General Staff after, after Conrad, does well in Romania. Um, then you of course have the 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 famous uh, defensive battles on the Asunso, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, <laughs> defensive victories for Austria-Hungary, uh, from which, which is a purely Austro-Hungarian front for most of the war, except for a very, very, very brief few months in, in 1917, from uh, yeah, September, when there isn't any battles, but in an active combat role, it's only from, from late October to to the end of December that, that German troops are there in any significant numbers for the the Cabaretto offensive. Um but otherwise it's it's a it's a it's a purely Austro Hungarian venture and they and they do well uh, and, and and fight well. And yes, you can always say that oh the you know God created the Italian army to uh, for, for Austria Hungary to have somebody to beat or the other way around. But they're they're not bad armies, and they they do fight well. And these battles are, are bloody, and and they swallow up a lot of resources. And they would have swallowed up a lot of resources of Germans as well. Um, and then you you can look at even even to the very last days of the war, Austria Hungary is fighting still. They have an incredible uh, durability in staying in despite all these casualties. They're in the war uh, until. Uh, November fourth, so just a week before the Germans are out as well, um, and in in Italy, during the uh, the Vittorio Veneto offensive in October uh, and uh, and into November of 1917, there there are points of that front where they're fighting and and winning local fights, uh, defensive fights with barely any ammunition, no food at all, no 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 uniforms basically just rags uh men without boots and everything they're still fighting and they're still able to maintain their positions and, and hold on to uh to to trenches and and make counterattacks and local counterattacks you also have uh, a few divisions going to to the western front in the middle of 1918 uh to fight the americans and the, the french um doing the uh the uh, Saint Hill offensive and and doing the the Musagon offensive uh and they also perform well and are, are, are commended for for what they they're doing by the Germans and and by by newspapers around the world you have american newspapers saying that 
oh, German, Germany has been saved by Austria and these local positions uh, on some heights because they, they, they do fight well and they do, I mean, they, they have no chance of winning, no chance at all, but, but they, they're doing well and they're, they're fighting as well as they can, delaying the enemy, allowing other units to, to retire to a better position, all these things. So, so yeah, you can always laugh at Lord through Hungary and say they're incompetent in this and that. But they did fight well, and they did last a very long time. I um, I generally think that they're kind of the the their legacy from the war in terms of on the military side of things is something where did they make some pretty big mistakes, especially early on? Yes, but the fact that they were able to recover in any meaningful way from that like first like catastrophic six or seven months is really impressive. Like, you know, given their sort of industrial base, their manpower base, their their sort of trained soldiers that they were working with, that they were able to recover and still participate meaningfully in multiple different offensives on multiple different fronts over the next several years is is impressive. Yeah, I think the, you, you, you touch on something important that they're, they're, they're dealing that they're doing very well with what they're given to begin with. Uh, they don't have the industrial facilities. Uh, to, to produce a lot of weapons and munitions and and all this this stuff immediately. I mean, they're they're struggling to produce helmets in the end of the war and and, and basic equipment. And so it, already in fifteen, they're producing um, like uh, air assets, uh, replacement mat- material, uniforms and equipment. And you, know, you, you get to the point where you're producing cardboard belts and uh, you know uh, uh, bags and backpacks and stuff like that made of uh, like strings of paper that have been impregnated to resist water and stuff like that. Uh, and all these things you, that, that, that <laughs> it does not make soldiers confident. <laughs> and, and, uh, and you, you, when you, when you take away the food and you take away the, uh, the warmth and security and all these things that, that disappear in the end uh, in the, in the, in the last, Yes, seven eight months primarily we, we really see a like a catastrophic situation on the on the italian front and of course also the other fronts but mainly on the italian front they, they, there really isn't anything left left but but the army still stays and it still goes on the offensive in in, in june 1918 a hopeless offensive again but 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 they go on a major offensive in 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 in, in june of 1918 and they do not break then and they they only break when the when the when the end is completely near basically and there is no way out anymore um Mm -hmm. you mentioned all these sort of economic issues that are causing serious problems at the front uh in terms of food and supplies and everything uh, you know, in a lot of European nations, they were all the, uh, on the citizen side of things, on the home front, everybody was affected. So what was life like in Austria-Hungary uh, during the war? Did they also suffer from these same kinds of sort of critical shortages? Yes. Um, th- there are several factors that, that, are, that are interesting about the, the home front when you talk about uh, Austria-Hungary. And... and uh, and some historians do talk about it as in home fronts because there's many different home fronts depending on where you are in this 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 multinational empire. Uh, it is not the same whether you live in 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 uh, in Bohemia or you live in Austria or you live in in Hungary. It's very different um, situation, uh, and and there there's of course many similarities as well, but. Austria-Hungary is, of course, as Germany and as Bulgaria and all these other uh, central powers, they, they're really suffering under the naval blockade, which uh, which uh, prevents them from importing food and, and, and a lot of the, the uh, materials, war materials that they need to produce everything from things they need on the home front, things they need in the, in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the war economy. In the war industry, um, but uh, but there are also some really really poor administration of what they have, uh, and they 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 make a lot of mistakes that that just further the problem uh, along the way, and and um, 
there are also, uh, for Austrian Hungary, there's a, a very big difference of whether you live in the city or whether you live in, in, in the rural side. People in, in, in rural areas generally have a little more because they often have the ability to grow food themselves. Uh, the situation inside the cities in 1918 is horrible. There is nothing uh, left, in, which of course sparks riots, uh, strikes, uh, walkouts from factories, and, and so on and so on, furthering the, the, the problems at the front uh, um, and, the, and the issues they have in, in supplying their armies. Uh, but then you also have, of course, uh, for Austria-Hungary, as you have in, in, in many other countries, but it's maybe especially for Austria-Hungary and 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 the countries that fight on the eastern front is that you have quite large zones of your country where the war is actually moving through um, at different times during the war. So Galicia is is one of them where the, where the whole thing changes hands a couple of times during the war. Uh, from after the Battle of Galicia, where the the the, the Austro-Hungarian armies withdraw to the uh, Carpathian Mountains and and the area comes under Russian control. They lose a lot of farmland. This is like the main farm area, um, and 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 they lose a lot of that. It's damaged during the war. They don't recover it when they go back again and and retake it later in 1915. All these things uh, have an effect, and of course, it also has an effect on the people uh, who live in these areas, who live in, in what is like the hinterland behind the front, the the zones behind the front. Um, also in Italy, and, and so the experiences were quite much more violent than it is anywhere else. Um, people there are subjected to to really terrible atrocities. They're accused of spying for either side, whoever whoever is there at the time. They accuse them of being with the other people and helping them, and then and, and 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 so on and so on. So there are atrocities being being perpetrated on the civilian population in these areas. Um, when, when the food start to go, when, when the economy crashes, when, when all these uh, issues are, are, arise, uh, or you have much more steam going into this, uh, this idea of being independent, getting out of this empire. Um, so, 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 yeah, the, the national tensions and, and the, the, the cry for independence, if you want, uh, Really grow as a result of the economy and the the, the system, uh, if you will, crashing. And then you also have um, a lot a, a, a large movement of people, um, which will also have an effect. For example, in in, in some of the big cities, you see a, a large influx of uh, of refugees from the east. A lot of uh, Eastern uh, Jewish people, and then they. That creates tensions be between the the people living there and these new people who come, and you already don't have the food for it, and and you know you have a growing uh, anti-Semitism towards them. Uh, you ha have uh, Italians coming, like um, Italians and, and Ger Germans living in the border area there, who 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 flee the area, and they of course create tensions in some way here and there. So, so there are a lot of of, of places where where you have this. Uh, rise of tensions between the groups because of the war. Um, so the the for the Hungary, the home front is not just one thing; it's a lot of different things, uh, and really depending on where you are. But but pretty miserable for most people. It's not like uh, you you have one group. Even even though that during the war, uh, a lot of people in Austria have this idea that in Hungary they're just hoarding the food and they just have it all and they they just don't want to share with us. But it's not always like like that. There, there are some truths to it, to it that there is a reluctance to to share what you have, but but things in Hungary is also pretty miserable, um, and uh, you you of course always have this uh, when when things are going well for Austria Hungary and and the central powers. You have this idea that oh, when we get Romania, we'll get a lot of food and we'll we'll, we'll get this uh, this uh, peace uh, with uh, with Russia and. Uh, we'll, we'll get a lot of food. We call it the bread piece, and 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 there's this hope that every time, but it it seems to always fail. That it it, it is nearly as much as you want, or you don't have the people uh, to to cultivate the food, and you have have a lot of just uh, wagons of grain standing somewhere, and you can't really move them, and they just uh, either rot or or, or or there isn't even enough to 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 feed the the occupation troops that that you need to 
had in the area to to make sure you get the food. Uh, it's a, there's a lot of this going on where you don't really get what you what you want, and which of course results in in, in terrible conditions on the home front and the, and the actual uh, front line as well. Yeah, I remember reading about when Germany and Austria-Hungary moved into Ukraine after the peace with Russia and how they were, oh, we're going to get all this food that we can ship back to Germany, we can ship back to Austria, and then they could barely feed the soldiers that they sent there. Yeah, I mean, I mean goods. for example, Ro- Romania, it's all uh, war through, uh, we're always running through the country uh, through most of 19, well, most of the second half of 1916 uh, war in, in in Ukraine, the war is going back and forth and uh, during the the first three years of the war it, it's it's a constant movement of, of, of the war uh, and because of this this movement of war, which is another thing that we talk about when we talk about, for example, the Eastern Front contra the, the Western Front this, this uh, much longer going war of movement is that of course a lot of territory is being destroyed a lot of cities are being destroyed the the, the farmers the, the people who who can do something about getting the food off the ground uh have all, all been scattered around so, so there's a lot of issues there where you don't don't have what you expect because you have this idea that this will just be great and in a minute we can just feed everybody but then uh, you, you start fighting, and, and there's infighting between Germany and Austria-Hungary as well. When they take, a, 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 like, who gets it? Who who's more important, Berlin or, or Vienna? Where should this this load of train, uh, this train load of, of grain go? Um, yeah, so so uh, it creates a lot of problems as well, and it never delivers what it promises. Mm-hmm. And you know, all these problems on the home front, as you said, kind of um, exacerbated existing differences between various groups. And of course, after the war, the empire disintegrates into a number of of smaller nations. But during the course of the war, those areas, you know, they were still loyal to Vienna, if if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, those men from those areas still fought well in the army pretty much until the end. You know, is, is that an accurate assessment? Yes, I mean there's a lot of discussion. It's a it's a relatively recent um, uh, uh, way to look at this uh, this issue because for a long time after the war, a lot of the the successor states uh, started to write their history of the war, and it it was much more um, focused on their like the the Czechs were writing about. The, the Czech history of the war and and so on and so on. Um, the Hungarians were writing about the Hungarian experience, and 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 you get got this very uh, like so it's, some historians call it like a like a tribal history telling where you, where you tell it from only your own view. You don't really get the 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 big story of the entire country, and and, and with that there there comes this uh, need to talk about your own soldiers as, as fighting their fight for their country. This is most, most pronounced in, 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 um, in the Czech post-war literature because there is uh, uh, an independence movement during the war working for, for, uh, for an, an independent uh, uh, Czech nation or, or Czechoslovak nation um, depending on uh, on who you ask, but but um, but there's an, an a need to sort of emphasize uh, to, towards the the allies during the war that oh we're forced to fight and we don't really want to be on their side we're on your side and, and uh, to 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 gain uh, support for for a nation for an independent nation state. Uh, to the point where, where where a lot of Czechs considered themselves after the war as being having been part, like having been on the side of the of the the Entente of, of the Allies, um, uh, and from there grows the idea of okay, they were all just fighting badly, and they saw the first chance to run to the enemy and surrender, and uh, and so on and so on. But it's not really what we see when you when you look at the the cases that that are there and the the um, the um, uh, the episodes that 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 are that are portrayed when when you go down and actually look at what happened, it's it's, it's more common that it, that something else happened 
Um, so a, a unit that, that was completely demoralized uh, and surrounded and had no other choice but surrender uh, after the war is portrayed as, oh, they just threw away their weapons and ran to the, to the Russians and jumped into their trenches and started firing their, at their own site and so on and so on. Um, but, but yeah, what, what you see during the war is that pretty much all the different nationalities fight well. Um, and you don't really see a mass desertion uh, of, of any soldiers. You see local, of course, but, but even in the end, in 1918, in, in, in September, October and stuff, when, 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 you, when you look at, like, why, why I mean, and, and the, the Allies are doing this, uh, you know, when, when they catch uh, uh, deserters that run to, to their side, they interview them, and, and some of the questions is, why did you desert? And, and, and the, the nationality thing doesn't really play a role at this point. It, it is, oh, we don't, we don't want to fight anymore, we don't, we don't want to die, or we don't have any food, uh, <laughs> which are all... Uh, which are all valid reasons for 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 deserting, but but you you it is not really seen in this sense that it is a, a big issue in, in that way, and it is not something that affects the army's ability to fight, as it is often being portrayed. That it's just uh, you go, the army goes to the front and all the soldiers disappear and run away from their officers, and they stand back and think, "What happened?" That is not an accurate depiction of what happens at all. It is very much this um, this uh, post-war uh, historiography of the war and, and writing it in in a very, uh, sp- with, a, with a very specific aim and a very specific story to tell. Yeah, and I guess at both like the official political level, there's uh, probably a, a desire for that uh, as they're working with other nations in the West being like, hey, look at how, you know, we were fighting with you this whole time. And there's also probably from like an individual soldier perspective, you know, a Czech soldier, even if he'd served well in the Austro-Hungarian army, probably didn't necessarily want to trumpet that to everyone around him after Czechoslovakia was created. He, you know, probably works better for him if he talks about how much he was, you know, fighting for Czech freedom. Exactly. And even more so, for, for example, if you were an Italian soldier or a Romanian soldier or one of these other soldiers who, who basically ended up fighting uh, against their uh, their motherland or father fatherland or, 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 or uh, in that way, fighting against them. Um, but then you also have to recognize that there is also during the war a lot of focus on from the Austro-Hungarian side, from, from, from the mainly German and, and Hungarian, uh, Africa is called mainly German, but uh, Hungary as well. But, but this, this distrust of its own soldiers, which is not founded, but it, 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 for example, throughout the war, there is a distrust of Czech soldiers. There is an idea that they are just waiting to run, which is also why this idea comes in the, in the post-war, because it becomes a very easy scapegoat to say, oh, we just lost because the Czechs ran away. Oh, we, this operation failed because they were all Czechs or they were not Germans or they were not uh, Hungarians or, or whoever you are. These, these, oh, these were Romanians and we're fighting in Romania. So of course we lost this, this particular battle. Uh, and it, it, can, it can save the skin of a general sometimes to, to, to blame it. And they do all these, um, uh, well, they do a, the whole, a whole big study of, of, of the, 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 the Czechs, for example, during the war, saying that, like, during the study, uh, uh, many hundred pages on, on the loyalty of Czech troops and, and, and don't really come up with anything that, that there, there isn't this thing. But, but of course, in the, in the post-war uh, writings of, of the war, uh, you have both both the official history and the and the Germans saying that oh it was all the Czechs and the Czechs are uh, saying yes yes that that was us because we didn't want to fight you uh, and and the, and the 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 truth or the uh, the reality is 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 buried because both sides are interested in it, in it being buried uh, which is which is an interesting um, uh, mechanism in a way uh, in the in the way the story is told that uh, that is only very recently. That, that people have said, oh, let's look at these things and let, let's see, oh, the, this is not what happened. Uh, and, and sometimes where Czechs are fighting uh, the Czech legions, with the, which were made by recruiting uh, 
Czech uh, prisoners of war in 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 Russia uh, and Italy and and other places as well. Um, you uh, you you have battles where Czechs fight Czechs, and it, it is not. Uh, it is it is hard to see a difference between the way a German regiment and a Czech regiment fought in those battles, um, so, but you have this distrust throughout the war, this uh, distrust of your own soldiers, and and during the war there are set, uh, there, there are a couple of regiments that are completely disbanded uh, by the emperor for being uh, not loyal, but. Uh, Two, two of them, uh, well, well, the two that are, uh, are, are both mainly Czech regiments. The most famous is the, the 28th Regiment, which uh, is, is the one where you, you hear the story of them, you know, marching to the Russian side with, with, with the, the, the regimental band playing and the banners flying. It's not as all what happened. They are isolated in, in, <laughs> and completely demoralized and, and are surrounded and, and forced to surrender. But they're... they're um, the the armies it's, they're struck from the from the army list of the of, of regiments and and all that but 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 what you see is for example in that case they disband the whole regiment but because there's a battalion uh, like a like a replacement battalion uh, on its way to 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 Russia um, of, of Czech soldiers to to replenish this regiment which which is more or less annihilated in 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 the uh, in the Carpathians, they're diverted to the Italian front instead, uh, and sent there where they perform extremely well because uh, the, the, there's a different conditions there. Generally, most of the well, most of the nations because there there is an idea uh, there is uh, something about Slavs not being too fond of fighting Russians, but pretty much all of them are very keen on fighting the Italians. Uh, and they've performed very well on the Italian front uh, to the point where the, the regiment is raised from this battalion again. Like they're they're they're, they're reinstated as a regiment because of what, what how the, well they perform uh, on the Italian front. And they're 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 checks uh, as well. So you, you you can't see it like that. You can't say that one one na- nationality fought worse than others. And especially when you go to the end of the war. Where where you can see who is leaving. Well, it's not always just the uh, like some of the places where people fight the longest. It's very mixed. Uh, there's Czechs and Poles and, and and a lot of different ones. Some of the 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 majority of the units sent to the Western Front are Romanians, uh, fight, fighting the 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 French and the um, the. Um, uh, the the Americans, uh, they are they the majority of those the regiments in those divisions that are sent there are from uh, from Transylvania, so they're they're sort of a mix of of Romanians and and, and Hungarians, but the majority of them are, are Romanians, uh, and they perform very well there. It's it, it's always interesting to hear kind of how in the immediate post war years various groups and various nations sort of look back on their own participation. And that that story seems particularly complicated, as you've kind of just described, for Austria-Hungary due to all these other sort of factors that are involved uh, that aren't really present in a lot of the other nations that were sort of fighting in the war. Yeah, I mean, you do see, see it. I mean, there's this idea that, that Austria-Hungary is this very multinational state, but it is nothing compared to Russia. It is much more uh, multinational and many different types of religions and and languages and I mean the, there's a lot of tensions between Finnish soldiers in the Russian army and Estonians and Latvians and uh, Lithuanians and Polish regiments and uh, uh, and Tatars uh, uh, Muslim faith and all these people recruited from from different areas. There's a lot of tensions there as well. It's just not not as well uh, researched yet in 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 the in in Western li- Western in English literature. Um, I say like like that because of course uh, Estonia and Finland has their own historiography where where where, where this this plays a big role, uh, but it's not as well re- understood for in in the English readership. Germany as well ha- have. You know, a Frenchman from from uh, from Alsace Lorraine. They have Poles. They have Danes. Um, uh, so, so there are uh, several multinational uh, empires. 
the Ottoman Empire is, of course, another one where you have all different ones where you have very big tents where you have Armenian, Armenians in the army um, as, as well. Um, uh, of course, creating some some pronounced uh, tensions uh, between the different nationalities. But but I, it is it is a it it becomes very much a part because the empire breaks up as as much as it does. All these different nationalities have a lot to say about it afterwards, and it becomes very clear uh, that that is a multinational empire that they all and it's, it is a focus point of of uh, of allied um, propaganda uh, efforts and. And, uh, and and intelligence and so on to to try to undermine this this uh, this enemy by pushing these buttons and 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 making it making it a fight about independence and about uh, the dis- the dismemberment of the uh, Habsburg Empire. Um, so, so so it does play a, a much bigger role in our understanding than than maybe the others do. Thank you.